Tammy is our secretary. She what? She's our secretary. She, yeah. Yeah. She got, but she's not here. Or, she's there. Well, oh, she's oh, there? Her. So I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, she did say she was. Well, I was prepared if I had to be. Yeah. <clears throat> Doc, you can just share your notes with her to make sure that they're both the same. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, you can start. All right. All right. We'd like to call this meeting to order. Oh. All right. I would like to call this meeting to order at nine. Yeah. AM. Um, first of all, we would like to um, certify the opening meeting law requirements. Is that correct? Okay. That's and, correct. And, and they I'd are like certified. To make They've been posted and people have been notified. All right. Um, I'd like to see a motion for a adoption of the agenda. I'll so move to adopt the eight item agenda. I'll second. All right. We have a adoption from Seisha and a second. Um, from Waldera. All right, number. F Are there any questions? Oh, is there any questions? Hearing none. Hearing none. So moved. All those in favor say aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. There's Perfect. Lori. There's Lori. Good deal. Okay, I'd like to also make yeah, a, like a motion to a, the adoption of the adoption November 15th, 15, 15, 15, 22 minutes. minutes. You need to know. You, you, you need to know. Mine is fine. Yeah, that's better. You need to turn the mic off on this computer. Oh, that's better. Yeah, that's better. It's not on. It should be fine. Let's turn it back on. Okay. Perfect. There. All right. Where was I at? Motion to, adopt the motion to adopt the minutes. Have a motion to adopt uh, November 15th, 2022 minutes. Um, motion to approve. Tonight, one way or another, we're okay. Yep, absolutely. In, um, we have the motion from uh, Sasha, right? Or Don, okay, uh, from Waldera, and we have the second from Sasha. Does that work? Yes. All right. Any questions? Any, any changes? All right, I say, I so move our... Hearing all those in favor. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> all right, we'll move to number five, reports. Are we going to start with the digital media update? Yeah, so um, kind of quite a few things to update on this month. Um, some of the videos that we posted recently, uh, we did a video with the High School Racing Association, which has a few students that are part of a, a newly formed racing organization just for high school students. So we did an interview with um, the uh, president and uh, one of the students that's in it. That was really great. We have that on our YouTube channel. We also did a Bruce Valley Stream Bank Restoration video. Um, we have a, we did, were at the festival, I was at the Festival of Trees Parade um, back in early December. Um, the Independence Christmas Lights, um, Nancy and Mary did that. I think they did a really great job on that. And they also did this past weekend the Wreaths Across America event in Independence, and there was also one in Osseo. Um, some recent purchases we've made, um, kind of getting towards the end of the budget cycle here. Um, <clears throat> I, I purchased a Canon Rebel 17 for pictures and video, and I also bought some storage bins for our archives. Um, the donation campaign is going pretty well so far. We've brought in over $2,150 in donations in the past month. Um, we're continuing to work with uh, TCC and Teleview on our uh, TV guide, program guide issues. Um, right now it just says like local programming if you pull up our channel on cable under the guide. So uh, TCC uh, updated their services and now it's not compatible with what we have so we're trying to work with Teleview and TCC together to get them so we can get our guide back on the air. Um, a lot of people miss that and love that so um, yeah it's something that we've been really dealing with and I'm hoping in January we can get it finally fixed 
um, it's something that we have to, like I'm kind of the middleman I need I'm kind of bringing TCC and Teleview together and it's not necessarily easy it's easy to get Teleview or uh, TCC here but Teleview is not real simple because they're not in the state so um, trying to get them to help virtually and through emails and phone calls has been definitely difficult but um, I think we should be able to get it fixed um, the best of the Midwest Media Fest entries uh, deadline is January 9th, so we'll be entering some of our best videos into that. Uh, we won a few awards last year. We won three achievement awards at the best of the Midwest Media Fest. So I'm excited to enter some more videos this year and see if we can maybe get an excellence award this year. So awesome. that's pretty much all for my update. All right. Anybody have any questions? Awesome. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, we'll go to number 5B, museum update. Is, is Nancy on? Nope. All right, if she comes back on, then we can go back to that. Yeah. That sounds great. Let's go to number C, the educator report. Who wants to start? <laughs> we'll start to my left with Andrea. <laughs> hoping I could hide. No. <laughs> so I have a verbal report this month because um, sometimes when I'm really busy I just take things off my plate and then don't do them and this was one of them. So <laughs> I've mainly been preparing for my maternity leave and so I've been making sure that Tammy is ready and then that Pat is ready because yeah. she technically is the authority in the county while I'm gone so I'm handing my clover hat to her. Awesome. So I've been making sure that everyone is ready so that I don't get the call because I will, like, I'm, the hard part is I'm, like, the only person besides Adam who was previously in this position long ago who knows how to do this job. So, like, it's really hard to step away and then be like, it's okay, you can have my child, mm -hmm. essentially. So, yeah, I'm, I've been trying to make sure that everyone is prepared and knows, like, has a web of people they can contact to support them. So that's been the main part. I finally finished charters and I'm sure you guys are like oh my god what the heck they take forever <laughs> and I finally got some of the rest of the letters sent out they, they're pretty much saying that um, as long as they turned in their annual financial report and this this gives people the permission from the USDA to use the clovers name and emblem because we are regulated under the USDA so I am the chartering authority and I make sure that people are meeting the requirements <coughs> in order to use our clover so I finally sent out the rest of the letters yesterday actually <laughs> and so Pat doesn't have to worry about those while she's Good. in charge and I told her what happens if people call and say this doesn't make sense because it I mean, people will do that. So I got that taken care of. <clears throat> Typically, during this time, if I wasn't preparing for a leave, I would be working on, well, I'm finishing up cookie baking, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but then I would be working on like clothing review and Festival of the Arts. I haven't done those in two years, mainly because of COVID and a little bit because of like sports and kids' schedules. Because I don't know if any of you have kids in like high school, but holy cow are they incredibly busy and it is hard to get people to commit to something that might not normally be on their radar so last year i had done a survey to see if i should do festival of the arts because it's one of those covid's taught me if i'm not going to have participation do i need to do the program because or else i'm spending a lot of time doing something that never actually achieves anything and then i could have spent that time in another place so um i what pretty much what my survey to rounded out is they would like to do it eventually <laughs> but last year was not the year so next year probably if everything goes as planned yeah. which hopefully <laughs> um i'll do festival of the arts again which is a program for like showcasing artwork that kids have been working on along with performing and speaking arts and music arts so it's a lesser known program in 4-h i grew up doing it when i was in buffalo county and i my sisters and i and some kids in our club we actually wrote plays <laughs> for it and directed them ourselves like we got really into it so this is something that i really want to bring back plus not a lot of other youth organizations besides ffa i say that as someone who went to school to be an ag teacher we have a lot of speaking contests in ffa 
4-H also has the ability to have speaking contests and I think that those are really great places for kids to learn public speaking and how to manage a crowd like things that you don't normally just learn unless you're put into that position so I'm hoping to bring that back and make sure that we're giving kids more of a platform um, other than that tonight actually is our last virtual cookie baking workshop um, I do this with another educator in Chippewa County and um, this year Portage County. So we've done four different cookies this year. We did a sweet potato spice one, which I actually brought in and nobody hated. And I have eaten a lot of, so <laughs> I got some decent feedback. Then we did, um, oh, kolachkis and English toffee. And then tonight we're going to be doing Fatiman. Did I say that right? It's it's Norwegian. Um, I just know that you um, deep fry them in lard. And so we have a family. Yeah, it must be good. They, they must yeah. be good. If lard is specifically yeah. used to fry, they That's must be right. good. <laughs> so uh, this is like my favorite program of the year because I get to teach kids food safety, food science, and it's all virtual. So um, you'll probably see me here tonight at 8 o'clock in my office because I don't have very good internet at home. So I just sit here and we... We do the session, but the kids are fantastic. We upped the age group this year. Normally it was like third and up, and this year we have it fifth grade and up, and they're, they're phenomenal. They, they're able to, they pick up everything right away. They're like, oh, yep, I've, I'm already halfway done with these cookies, and it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm so happy that, I'm like, why aren't you teaching this? Because I'm, I just picked up this cookie recipe yesterday, and I started making it. <laughs> but it's really great, and I love to, I really love doing the food science aspect behind it because to me I'm like we should know kind of what we're doing in the kitchen and why we do something like when you use baking powder or baking soda do you know that you have to have an acid in order for it to work like if you don't know that then you if you just forget like oh I'm not gonna add the buttermilk or I'm not gonna add this then your cookies don't do anything and you're like well why did this not happen so they need to interact exactly it's just like the baking soda and vinegar yeah. so so yeah, I'm, that is, this is my favorite one to teach and I, I get very excited about it. And so we're gonna finish our cookie baking and then get to put it to rest for the year. <laughs> How many participants? So we have about 29. And this is for the whole Northern of state of Wisconsin. Cause eventually we wanna make it a statewide program. Typically it was just a handful of counties. We do have some <coughs> in Trempeau County who are participating, but we also make sure that we record it so that if they're not able to attend, once again, busy families, they can watch it and they get all, everything so that they're able to then participate later, which is great. Um, so yeah, then other than that, a lot of what else I've been doing in my spare time, um, club transition support. There's been a lot of clubs in Trumple County that have transitioned leaders and so then I have to come in and I either have to train the new leaders in VIP and make sure that everything is kosher on that end along with I've had some clubs who are like <coughs> I need this from the club leader but I really don't feel comfortable talking to the club leader or the old club leader. Can you help? So I've been doing a lot of like mediating not nothing wrong just sometimes people are not as easy to get a hold of and I have authority I guess I'm not sure but <laughs> I've been working to make sure that those transitions are as smooth as they can be so that when I'm kind of gone Tammy and Pat don't have to pick up the pieces with that then also of course trying to get people trained that is a, a whole job in itself because it takes I mean, you have to have an open schedule and you have to be able to meet people where they're at. And that's why I do a lot of like nights and weekends, mainly nights. Um, lastly, uh, I was doing, I'll, I'll put in Jackson County stuff because it was, it was a big part of my time. I was working with their awards program. So they do a big like awards banquet every year for their program. And so I had to do a lot of like creating the certificates. I brought everything to the program and I supported the leaders who were working on it. And so that did take up quite a bit of my time the past month. So other than that, in a nutshell, that is what I did. <laughs> so how long are you going to be out for? I'm taking 10 weeks, okay. whenever that starts. <laughs> yeah. I suppose. Don't know. Uh, yeah, that's the worst part. Yeah. So can't make any plans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> January 9th. So and I'm taking next week off because I'm like, well, I need to clean my house. <laughs> Get rid of <laughs> We're, we're currently working on it, so it's under construction. <laughs> so there, 
it's just the fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, any other questions? Anybody have any more questions? No. All right. Awesome. Then I think we go around the horn and ask Adam. Hello, uh, so uh, nice to see you in person. Uh, my name is Adam Trunzo. I'm a youth and families educator, so I'm kind of split between two institute areas within uh, Extension. Um, mine is the final page on, um, on your packet, and I've broken it down into kind of three general areas. So we've got youth education, family education, and then kind of building capacity, kind of some systems level work that Extension kind of really excels at. Um, so within youth education, this is kind of direct education to the youth in the county. The first one is um, working with Monica, and she can share some more about this. We finished our first, and really the first, high school session in the state of Wisconsin here in Arcadia, working with Latinx youth um, in Spanish and kind of having a space at the school for them to gather and get all of their questions answered um, about um, what's how do we finish high school successfully how do we um, you know explore options for trade school or military or tech school or four-year university different options for for some of their work so um, that was really really successful and I'll let Monica share a little bit more about that later on but we are planning another session um, for middle school students in the spring so, uh, the same thing that we did last year um, additionally we had a FAFSA night so the federal application for or the free application for student aid um, open to everyone in Arcata, all these programs are open to everyone. Um, and we had uh, specialists come in from Madison, drove all the way up here and worked with Arcadia students directly, answered their questions, um, and they were, they were experts in their field. So it was very nice to have them there and answering those questions of the parents, of the students, and getting them where they need to go um, financially to, to be where they want to be. Uh, the other one we have is teaching and coordinating direct STEM education programs. I've been doing this long term uh, for a while, so I've built up a lot of really strong relationships. So it doesn't take a lot of my time to kind of plan, coordinate, build those relationships. It's very kind of set and they kind of expect it and it's a part of um, some very large $100,000 grants that schools get is having partners like myself come in regularly. Um, and just at the last one that I did in Arcadia, they said, hey, um, what I've typically been, do been doing is helping out with their grants. So I'll, I'll review them, I'll add our partner statement, different things like that, that allows them, you know, that could be the difference between them getting, being able to have an after school program or not. So it's very um, kind of strong relationships we have there. And I do direct education, so we do um, all sorts of kind of exploratory science things that maybe, uh, you know, an elementary school or a middle school teacher doesn't have the time to do once it gets to the end of the day or an after school program. Yeah, so it stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Um, so it's the general idea is each of those things sh shouldn't necessarily be taught separate from the others. Is it when they all come together, you use all of them to fix problems. So usually a session will start off with a problem. So um, one of the problems we had is build an earthquake resistant building or something like that. So they use um, science to kind of come up with a hypothesis and test it. They use engineering to go through, we talk through the engineering design process and what jobs are available for engineers. And we talk about, you know, is it okay to fail? It's like, they say no, it's like, yeah, it's awesome. Cause then you learn a new thing, you have a new problem and you start the process over of kind of coming up with a plan, building a prototype, testing it and, and going through that process. So it's nice to get them early on to be thinking about that. Um, so that later on when they're in middle school and high school, middle schoolers, high schoolers, that they see themselves as being able to do science. Cause oftentimes they sort themselves, I'm not a science person, but if we can get them early enough, they're like, yeah, I can do that. It's pretty good. So they stay engaged in school um, as they go forward. Yeah. Any other questions for the youth education stuff before I go into family education? Um, so the family education, I did a dad and me uh, program with the Blair Taylor Head Start. I think I mentioned a little bit about that last, um, last time, but I just wanted to kind of mention that. Um, ongoing things are, a lot of this is within the justice system, so working with um, those parents who maybe um, are in a place where they're more receptive to um, education or kind of changing or adapting some of their parenting behaviors and um, parents who might need a little bit of extra support. So working in the jail, teaching reentry skills, teaching some kind of positive parenting, positive cognition so that they can kind of not just s learn new parenting skills, but also just see themselves as a worthwhile addition to the family. Because a lot of times, yeah, parents is like, uh, you know, I'm not engaging with my child right now while I'm in here, or I haven't engaged with them for years because of X, Y, Z. A lot of times it's kind of mental blocks that they might have about like, they don't want to be around me, or I don't have anything positive to contribute, but really sitting down and working with them to be like, yeah, 
they need you there. Like, you just have to be present and like be in a positive headspace. And like, you, there's just so many positive things that come from that. Um, one other thing that I wanted to share is maybe we could pass it around. Keep one if you want, or pass one. Um, is I co-authored um, this fatherhood report that's been about four years in the making with other people in the state, um, and it, uh, it involved uh, stakeholder interviews here in Trumplow County. Uh, it involved um, focus groups, and then a lot, a lot, a lot of data and analysis. So this has been shared widely in, within the state, and it's starting to be adopted through kind of the Department of Public Instruction and other groups for kind of a premier um, resource for engaging fathers um, in programming that typically doesn't engage fathers. If you think of a typical parenting program, it doesn't often kind of have a focus or an effort to reach out or engage fathers in that process. And so we're hoping to change that um, with an extension is saying, hey, these dads are here, they need some help, and we need to make sure that we have um, resources that specifically speak to them. So um, we're really proud to have this report out. Um, and then uh, the other thing is we're planning some uh, parenting education sessions in the spring. So a lot of times it'll be probably from the 8 to 9 p.m. Once, once kids go to sleep, parents are there to be able to be engaged and, um, and, and log in. So it's kind of nice. Uh, moving into the building capacity portion. So I'm working with a lot of these different uh, groups to kind of impr improve their ability to, to function or even to begin uh, some of their operations. So the Alliance for Youth, um, one thing that we do there is we gather money and then we also distribute the money, um, whether it's within the group or broadly to people within the county. So we were able to um, fund with seed money a brand new middle school um, food pantry in Arcadia. So the the middle school counselor there is like, I don't know, we just need to get something going. We need to help these students, but we don't know how, and there's no other money for it. So by being a part of this association, they were able to ask for that money, and now this thing is happening that wouldn't happen without kind of extension being there and coordinating these, uh, these efforts. Um, one other thing, I, I remember Andy early on was kind of mentioning kind of bringing in faith-based groups to work with Extension a lot. Um, and since then, I've been kind of thinking that through a lot and being very purposeful in kind of connecting churches in the area, whether that's volunteers or different things. So a lot of that builds into this capacity stuff. So we had in November a resilient and trauma-informed communities group that collects to talk about kind of um, how to build resiliency within uh, individuals, but also communities. A lot of that's connecting people together, and um, faith-based groups have been a large part of that. And we had a gathering in the Trempolo room, which was just like this big round robin of sharing resources and just connecting people. A lot of times it's this mental health provider that didn't know that Blair Taylor needed some extra help, or there's this person that's really great with uh, with this type of child, and there's this group that, <laughs> that needs that help, and they, we were able to connect them where that wouldn't happen otherwise. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is uh, our Jail to Community Reentry Coalition. That group, um, we've kind of, it's been very difficult going, but recently the jail has had been able to hire some new capacity and they've got some kind of new programming leads in there. And so because we've had a long standing relationship with them, they engaged us um, to say, hey, who else can we get in here? So now we're getting financial education from RCU in there. The Whitehall Public Library will be coming in and doing literacy programs and a number of faith-based groups being able to come in and doing whether that's um, relationship counseling, co-parenting from a distance, uh, different things like that. So really getting groups in there um, to, to meet with people, to, in, to connect them with a community outside so that they're not just this separate group that just goes in and out and in and out and just really helping them to get their feet under them. Um, and then the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, one other thing that we've been doing there is I helped to get them to move from this independent group that had to pay six to $700 in um, board of directors insurance to kind of where we can work under the state um, because we're a smaller group. Um, so we don't have to pay that uh, money anymore. And we can then focus our efforts and our resources towards helping people in the county. And really like the, the NAMI group, um, we need a lot, of, a lot of extra support, but that group can can really take off and is really something critical. We were just at um, the next group, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, which is the DA, the judge, the victims witness advocate, human services director, all getting into a room every other month um, and talking about what people need. And really, it's mental health. Um, I know they put a little bit of extra money towards some extra hours for mental health programming in the jail. Yes. Um, but and, and the, the idea is we share that out. So um, using that 
and that group prioritizes and focuses those things. So because that group convenes and I kind of convene them and talk them through things, then we're able to say, okay, if the jail does a little bit of this, uh, the sheriff's office does a little bit of this, human services does a little bit of this, and we kind of work together and align our efforts, it's a lot better, um, a lot bigger impact than if just one person just kind of does one thing and kind of hopes and prays that it, that it has an impact. But if we're all doing a little something in the same direction, it really does help. Um, yeah. <clears throat> just like I'm saying, um, I've been involved with other NAMI affiliates, not just in Trumpelo County. Mm -hmm. you go, even though for a small county, you guys do a lot better because I've been involved with other NAMI affiliates where they're very, um, how do I say it? They don't, they can't get along with each other in the community. It's just, I see where you guys are. When you have some, some of the NAMIs have people that founded it years ago and they don't want to change. Mm -hmm. And that's going to kill your group. And I'm glad you guys aren't that way or willing to explore other things. Yeah, thank you. How about um, opioid money? Can you tap into some of that like the sheriff's tapping into? Yeah, so that was, uh, that was the main conversation that we have at the CJCC meetings, the last two that we've had, is we've got this opioid response money coming in, right? And it seems natural that the CJCC would be um, a good, uh, maybe not a decision point for that, but we've got all those people in this room that, that are involved with the justice system, which unfortunately is closely aligned with the opioid um, response, right? So um, we, um, we've been kind of having conversations about that. It's like, how can we work together to spend that money effectively? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's certainly kind of in our, in our mindset, and that was one thing that the sheriff was sitting here when we were talking about that, um, was that the opi some of that opioid response money was that mental health, and that was awesome to hear. And like, what else can we do right. with it that's, that's aligned with that specifically? Good. Good, good, good. Um, similar to um, when we were talking about with NAMI is with the CJCC, one of the things we're trying to do is now I've been trying to expand out the citizen um, impact within that group. Because before, it's just a bunch of people with guns. So, you know, the, the DA, the all these people who have, who are in it very, very deeply. And sometimes, like you say, there's a reluctance to change or different things like that. Bringing in citizen members to be at that table and be um, decision makers has, I think, has a huge impact in just asking the questions like, well, why are people released from the jail with nothing in December? Mm -hmm. And, you know, no, that's taken for granted within a group of professionals, but it takes a, a, a citizen to, to ask those hard questions and, and see if there's answers. Can you help me with what CJCC is? Yeah, so it's the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. So that's all of these. Um, oh, I see. Yep, so the top members of each of the county agencies that have a, a, a strong role in, um, in the criminal justice system. Are you looking for any citizen members at this time? Um, it's likely. So one of the things that I really focused on was getting a faith-based member in there. So we were able to get um, um, Peter Jonas here from um, Our Saviors in, in uh, Whitehall, and then we are able to get the chair of the NAMI organization cool. at the table as well. Awesome. Um, so having those two members um, was really, really important. And um, yeah, they've okay. started to get their feet under them and really have an impact <laughs> of saying, yes, we're here. Here's, here's what we, we need from, um, from these organizations. Perfect. Um, and then grant funding, this will tie into a, another point that we have, but we're just kind of bringing in some, some additional funds to the county to, to offset or to support whether it's our programs or some of the, um, the organizations that we work with. Any qu questions? If you are looking for, I apologize, are, if you do choose to look for um, citizen members, how do you go about doing that, or how would you? Um, often it's done through referrals, so the the board has to kind of approve the members of of the makeup, and we usually kind of assign it as like one faith based group, one. But we haven't had really a formal process for it. We're just getting started with it, um, so. I would have to double check the bylaws, but it's typically uh, typically it's one uh, somebody who's brought forward by the by the body itself as a, as a good member, and then the board would vote on it. Thank you. Yeah. Are we? Do you lead the NAMI group, or are you just assisting with that group? So I'm currently the treasurer of that group. Um, Scott Brown is the person who's running that group, um, along with Jane Pope. So um, I have in the past kind of strongly supported them with some strategic planning and some um, capacity building, but it, it's Scott Brown's kind of running it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Monica, are you ready to 
give us your show. Okay, hi, good morning. Um, I was listening to all the amazing things that Adam was sharing and I just want to take a little bit along. Yeah, we've been doing good things in the community and as uh, everybody knows, I'm a Juntos coordinator. Um, and also I'm a, a food-wise educator, so I'm taking two, two jobs right now and I'm in the process of learning with the food-wise and preparing myself for um, lunch in January with uh, lessons and kindergarten lessons. Uh, but start with Juntos, I think we had a really good uh, uh, turnout with the high schoolers. You know, we teach them about, uh, we educate them about post-secondary education. We have parents who participate. We take groups to uh, visit one college in La Crosse. Uh, we got uh, members of the community participating and also, you know, the community took this really well for the people who attend. Um, we're still working, as Andrea mentioned before, I don't know high schoolers get so busy, but their schedule is, oh my God, it's really hard to find a space for them to um, participate in extra things uh, with another uh, <coughs> groups uh, or um, uh, clubs. And, and I think, uh, I feel like we're doing a strong with Juntos. Um, a lot of parents from middle schoolers are starting asking when we're gonna come back uh, with our workshops to the middle school. Uh, we had really good support with the school principals and administrators for the middle school. I, I'm happy with that. We have really good connection. Um, and I working around to um, get more community members to participate in Juntos. Um, uh, last time we brought somebody from, um, uh, this is new, it used to be Whitehall the Specialties. I think right now they call it Ornoa, Ornoa. And, um, you know, I met this, uh, it's a friend of mine who works there as a HR person, so, She's a Latina and she shared her uh, experiences and very motivated because that's what we need to hear in the Latino community and in the community in general. So I'm making these connections and try to show the community that we are capable to keep building a strong community in Arcadia and at towns around Arcadia. And um, now for nutrition, uh, food white nutrition, um, I do not have much to share about what April is doing in Jackson County, but for what I've been doing with her, um, she's been training me, I've been learning, I've been participating in these lessons. Um, I'm, still, I'm still learning. Um, again, I'm gonna be ready to launch out um, lessons in January with Arcadia School District and Independence and Whitehall. Um, and we have a pretty uh, big classrooms each time we go in and we learn, we learn about um, the five groups and uh, we, we the, the, the students, I'm happy to see how the students are taking this because normally, you know, we didn't, uh, before Food Wise didn't have a bilingual person, but right now we are having, um, well, they have me and now I, I can see students taking this um, very welcoming um, but for the kids that do not speak Spanish um, and when other students that do speak Spanish try to make questions or try to name things that we teach in that time, they're excited to see how I, I can see that the, they welcome this program and being bilingual is a big thing because you show it to them that, that uh, you yes, you are allowed to speak in your language and yes, you're allowed to share your language with you know, people around you. So I'm very excited. Um, I don't know if uh, April is today in the meeting, but I think that's all I have for now. I don't know if anybody has questions. I got a question for you. How, I mean, it's kind of a loaded question, I guess, but how do you, how do the kids feel about the teachers in these schools? Um, and, and this is uh, for Juntos or for... Yeah, yeah, for, basically, for I mean, life. well, just for the schools itself, when you go to these schools, do they, do you ever get any comments on how they're being taught or if they don't understand or 
you know, what they understand, um, I guess? Well, uh, a lot of time because um, second graders, it, it depends the district. Like in Arcadia, we have a large community of Latinx and um, and they let us know who is fluent in English and who is not fluent. And I think kids are taking this, um, um, you, you know, how I can explain uh, a new student who's not bilingual or who doesn't speak English is um, they're there paying attention whether if they understand it or not. But my job is to make sure they understand it. So if the teachers told us, you know, this student does not speak English and um, there's some way we can work around that. So when I used to come, when April used to do the second graders and it was virtual, she was virtual. So I pulled this group of kids who are not bilingual by me and I'll be translating or reading the book. But I think in the students are taking these food wise program really good like they want to learn for the junto side i think for high schoolers it's really hard to say but i because it's been a lot of a lot of teachers there new hires there are a lot of new stuff in there and it's it's, it's been a little hard in the communication because they're still knowing the community still knowing the people they're still knowing the students so it's it's kind of hard to say what are they thinking about our programs or what the students think or the generous students, you know, think about it. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It's, I just, you know, it's, you get concerned about them being frustrated and that's the first line, or that's the, I mean, they get defensive and you don't want them frustrated. So, I mean, that's why we have this program, yeah. so, but. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and what and and the amazing thing is, like I said, I'm not talking about me in person. I'm talking about anyone who decided to step up and say, you know, I'm going to be leading something. Our leaders who are bilingual are really important, not just for our community here in Arcadia, it's our community and the county in general. Because I I receive the respect I. I need and I deserve around the community and around the students. And um, one thing is when it's something that is not going right or they feel frustrated with someone or a teacher or, you know, you name it in a district or in the community, they know I'm there to support them. And if they have any questions, they come to me and I say, how I can get this done or how I can get answers to my question or where I can find this help. And uh, talking about juntos, I mean, um, when parents have a question about college, they know they can come to me and say, hey, um, you know, what did you know about this college? Or how do we apply for this college? Simple FAPSA. A lot of parents are not aware the FAPSA is there for students who are, who are born here or they have a legal status here. But it's not there for kids who don't have any legal status, so they don't feel comfortable to go and ask to, um, I will say, a Caucasian teacher or anyone in the community. They feel free. They feel comfortable to come to me and say, "Hey, I don't have any papers. How I can get these resources?" Without uh, being afraid of what the answers, uh, what their questions will be. So that part made me feel comfortable in my position because I'm not just helping one side of the community, I'm helping both sides of the community. Awesome, that's great. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? All right. Melissa, are you and your helpers ready? Yeah. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. So um, I was not, at the committee meeting last month, I was traveling uh, to a conference presentation. So I'm not sure if you got my report, but I'll just do a quick synopsis. Um, and I also don't know if Kevin, if you shared the video that we did of the Joe Petrick Park, honoring Joe Petrick Jr. Did you, were you able to show that last month? Um, no, we didn't share it at the meeting, but it is on social okay. media, so people are able to. Okay. I think I sent it to everybody in the committee, too. Oh, oh. Um, okay. So, 
they're able to watch it on their own time. Okay, thank you. I did have it available to share, but I realized that that's not always optimal sharing it over Zoom. So if you have that, um, I just wanted to be able to share that that was something Kevin and I worked on. Um, also, I did a lot of election training in October and the first part of November. Uh, I train election workers across a couple different counties, including Tripolo County. Uh, so I did several election worker trainings leading up to the election. Um, I also shared some of my community development work um, at a couple conferences. I have a piece right now on uh, the closure of rural pharmacies that I did with uh, an economist at UW-Madison. And then I also did a feature on Arcadia and Abbotsford and Latinx downtown development. And I was able to share that at the Forum of Migration Conference. Um, and then also um, looking at some more water testing funds that might become available through a grant that we have at the office. Um, and that's about all I can share now, given my helpers who are losing a Christmas present now. <laughs> any questions for me? Anybody have any questions? No thank, you. no, thank you so much. Now you see why I don't do parenting education. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. Take care of them so they Merry don't Christmas. lose. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Steve, you're up. Okay. Yeah, so my little helper is going to be able to open his presents but not play with them if he doesn't get his homework done. <laughs> so, Steve, anyway. you, Steve, you should do parenting programming. I would take that class. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, was, that was my wife's idea. I'm just backing her up. Uh, so working two counties, I'm not sure what I've reported on here to Trempolo County or not. So... There's a, a written report that should be in your files. I'm not going to bore you with reading something that you can read yourselves. Uh, and I don't remember if I reported on that or not, because that was from October, November. I don't remember when meetings were and so on. Um, what I've been working on here lately is uh, we had a, a grain, first in the series of grain marketing meetings in Melrose and uh, we discussed uh, the river, the, the Mississippi River as levels have been low and how that's impacting grain and other products moving down the river and fertilizer coming up the river because even though we're not applying fertilizer now, warehouses are typically refilled during the fall period. And uh, so they're refilled fall and then spring as soon as river opens. So that's a question mark there of, how that's going to happen. And a, a tow of barges carries the equivalent of hundreds of semi trucks. So if they have to, um, if they have to uh, move that fertilizer up with semis or trains, it's going to get a lot more expensive than it is now. So those were some of the topics that were discussed and how farmers can can uh, work to try to mitigate those circumstances. So at the January meeting, I will be discussing some basic agronomic recommendations of, of which fertilizers to use, how much and, and so forth. And so that's coming up January 10th. And then also another project that I'm working with Carl Dooley on, he's the agent in Buffalo County is, these chicken barns since Pilgrim's Pride um, bought out Golden Plump, the management of the barns has changed. So they're doing a, under Golden Plump, they would just keep the litter in the barn for however many turns, I forget now, and then they would clean out everything. So now what they're doing is a process called housekeeping where they drive in with a tractor and pulls a machine behind it that removes the clumpy cake, they call it. So the, the wet stuck together manure and bedding. And that process, there's some other additives that people use and that Pilgrims wants people to use in the barns that uh, ties up or gases off the ammonia and that type of thing. So we're thinking that the chicken manure does not have the same potency as it always had or or nitrogen specifically. So 
we're taking samples now as people are housekeeping their coops so that we can have those tested. They'll be tested at the University of Missouri lab because they do a lot of poultry down there and it's a specific test. We can test poultry manure here at Wisconsin labs, but they use a different test and they've got a lot more experience at Missouri. So those samples are being taken now and, and frozen out in nature's ice box for us. And uh, those will be sent down to Missouri. So we will get some data here, hopefully before spring planting season. So farmers know how much nitrogen is in that manure or how much isn't. Um, so, yeah, we've got pl a lot of planning going. I've got a lot of planning going on now and, and that sort of thing. Um, so any any questions? Um, Mr. Chair, um, I, I also help out on a poultry farm. Jenny O is the same way. They're trying to get us as farmers to do housekeeping instead of waiting until the last minute, which is I think is a good thing. We call it tilling, which is same thing, different name. Uh, the tilling helps knock down the cakes also. and. The nitrates and also have a second question let's say a farmer whether it was uh, the old golden plump or pilgrims or genio wanted their soil tested where would they take the samples to well um egg source labs is probably their their best bet they're out of uh, stratford so contact egg source labs in stratford yes uw does have a soil testing lab and i'm probably supposed to promote that but their turnaround time is absolutely horrid and until they get some efficiency built into the lab i'm not going to recommend that lab so egg source labs is a state certified you know private lab but they have they have good turnaround and because they're state certified they have good accurate results um, don't use an out-of-state lab or one that's not wisconsin certified because the fertilizer recommendations resulting from those soil tests will not be calibrated and accurate for Wisconsin. Um, there's also Rock River Lab. Um, they are also a very good lab. Um, so Egg Source or Rock River, either one of those two. You know, I got a question for you when it comes to the water. Um, I know fall, of course, that was low, but with all the snowfall we're having and expect a lot more, is that can, that'll help out a lot in the spring, won't it, to move these barges? It, it should, right, it should. So when we did that program that was before our, uh, our last snowstorm, so yeah. we still didn't know where we were gonna sit. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. okay. Thank you, folks. Uh, oh. I always forget to do that. My <laughs> apologies. I'm, you know, Kevin is shooting me the glare of <laughs> put on your mic. So, uh, next on our agenda, there it is, is um, roles and responsibilities. Roles and responsibilities, <laughs> yeah. Um, I had been requested by one of my, um, come on, move this, um, there we go, well, that didn't, you a slideshow. yeah, I am, oh, there we go, from the beginning, it didn't go all the way down. There we are. I had been requested by one of my committees to um, talk about, you know, what it is that uh, an extension oversight committee did, and uh, there had were still questions about what my job was. So I put this uh, presentation together to kind of give um, committee members an introduction, and it's good because so many of you are new to Excellent. to extension, so made sense um, your authority actually originates in state statutes in chapter 59 so 59.56 sub 3 and this is an old statute don't ask me how old it's it's been around for a while but it says in cooperation with the university and so on the committee on agriculture and education 
ex agriculture and extension education shall have the responsibility to formulate and execute the university extension program. So yeah, we're in state statutes, but it's, it's not a must, it's a choice that people have. And the counties have done it for a very, very long time. Um, I'm trying to think if it, it dates back to 1924 in this county, I think. So we have been around for quite a while. And over those years, there have been a lot of changes. Uh, one notable one is that we are now 100% state employees, but we've actually been that way since the early 90s. Um, and that's been regulated by originally, it was called a 133 contract. It's now referred to as the 136 contract. Last month we signed that. Um, and those numbers actually just refer to the funding line in the university's budget. <laughs> it took me 30 some years to realize that, but that's okay. Didn't need to know, so I didn't bother. One of the things that's changed a lot is that our programming has expanded. Uh, when extension started in Trumpelo County, you had the egg agent. That's what you had. Um, and over time, they added uh, the family living and, and 4-H, and then late um, in the 60s, they added community development. And then the kinds of projects that we work on in that time has really changed. You know, the 4-H agent from the 1950s could not possibly have imagined virtual cookie baking. You're right, <laughs> exactly right. Especially 4-H, huh? <laughs> you know, um, or, or programming on mental health. But some things haven't changed. One of the commonalities that I've discovered as I've read through all the minutes um, for Trumpelo County is that soil conservation and water quality have always been a primary concern here. Um, and then the other big change that occurred, obvious change that you can see, that occurred with the reorganization was the hiring of an area extension director. Now, that's what I am. I used to be what Melissa is. So, uh, but the area extension director is not a department head like you think of your other department heads. Um, but even in the old days when they were called department heads, they weren't really department heads because they were, they did a, a minimal amount of administrative stuff and mostly were doing educational programming. And I do more administrative stuff. I'm really focused on, you know, building the partnership with the county committees. Um, on supervising the educators, really not so much telling them you must program in X or Y, but more along the lines of coaching them. It's like, what are you seeing out there? How can we respond to that? Trying to help them do their job as best they can. Oh, look, um, one of the things that's interesting is that we actually have limited oversight to county support staff within the office. Now, what does that mean? That means sort of the day-to-day, -day, you know, Tammy, we need you to do X, Y, Z. I can do that because that's sort of the expectation. But if there were an issue, the legal oversight is out of my hands. Uh, so um, thank you. This is very helpful for me to wrap my head around how this is looking. But to that end, I just have a couple of questions. So. Who, so Tammy is a county employee, and she correct. is your office assistant. Uh, yes, is that correct? Office like the coordinator term may not be correct. Yeah, I think she's our office coordinator. We we got her. Is that the same as the financial coordinator in some of the other departments too? Or <laughs> it's Tammy. Can you help me? <clears throat> is she there? Um, I hi there, guys. I do do the financial too. I do pay all the bills. I work with the budget. Pat and I start with the budget. What is that like in July? So basically, you I run the office. But um, last year when they did the, I call it a reclass or whatever they 
I said, there's a lot more financial going on in here, and that was recognized. So, yeah, you kind of oversee a lot of stuff, and um, you do a lot. I don't know if I'm a master of them all, but I do my best. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And then I guess my question is, is then everyone else, then yourself included, are state? We are state and employed. by UW-Madison or the um, state? Uh, that's where our checks come from. The county is charged a fee for the educators. They do not yep. pay for me. You don't put any money into me, but you do pay a set amount of money for each educator. And I think that's what we addressed last. That's meeting. what right. you addressed last time. Yeah. Okay? okay. Thank you. I know that can be that can be somewhat confusing. Um, I also su support the educators and the staff who are directing our extension volunteers. That's why I've taken on this responsibility of wearing the clover hat while um, Andrea is on maternity leave. Um, I also have another county where the position is empty and I'm the queen of the green <laughs> until we get that person replaced. Um, and then I also monitor and manage risk and liability. As you can imagine, um, an institution as large as UW <laughs> Madison really, really wants to manage that kind of closely, um, which is also why a lot of the, the rules and guidelines, particularly with 4-H, have changed a lot. Um, and if you talk to any of them, boy, they'll tell you. Uh. What counties do you t t uh, see oversee right now as AED? Uh, that's an excellent question, Kevin, because uh, it varies across the state. But I oversee four counties. I oversee Pepin, Buffalo, Trumpelo, and Jackson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pepin, Pepin Buffalo, Trumpelo, and Jackson. So I'm working with all those committee members, the staff in those counties, you know, other potential partners. Do you have a question? I just wanted to kind of add on to that. So the, one of the reasons why they had those four is that we're kind of rural, smaller counties between two kind of major metropolitan areas. So they oh, were okay. very, they were very um, thoughtful in that grouping. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Where do you spend most of your time? Mm -hmm. These days, actually, I spend most of my time here. One of the things that we discovered with, um, with COVID, and I, I think it was a very positive thing, is that yes, I need to be present in those other counties, but much of the work I can do remotely via yeah. Zoom, via phone, whatever. Um, so I spend most of my time here. Um, I make a point of going to every oversight committee meeting. I think in the five and a half years, I may have missed one or two. Um, that's very important to me um, because I view the partnership as very important. Um, so what else do we do? Well, I uh, develop and provide oversight of the local budget. So I'm working with typically the office manager, the secretary, to actually prepare the budget, at least in two of the counties. In the other counties, it's me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, but that daily, you know, that daily paying the bills, the daily monitoring, those kinds of things, actually that's something that we have the county support staff do. Um, I mean, that's why Tammy says there's a lot more financial stuff to that. Um, if there's a, a change in, in how something might be spent or if it's a big expenditure, you know, we'll talk about that. And then depending on the county, you know, I either have to give permission or it can just go forward. So that's the other thing to keep in mind. Four counties, four different policies and procedures that I have to follow. Um, I hire the extension educators. I am considered the hiring authority. Now, the thing to keep in mind about that, um, I got a lot of questions from other counties about this, especially when we started, because the counties had always played this key role and they were like, oh my gosh. Um, 
the university pays for, I mean, we write position descriptions according to their standards. We, I put together a search and screen committee, that's me and um, probably a program <coughs> manager and one or two other people. And we'll review, we'll collect all the, the applications and we'll review them. And then we usually have that first interview. And then I do, I will, with the exception of Foodwise, bring the, the, the candidates, the two or three candidates, back to the committee. And I will have an interview with the committee there as full participants. And the way I do it is everybody, not everybody, I have right of first refusal and the committee has right of first refusal. So what does that mean? That means if we interview people and there is a candidate that you guys love, that you think they are the cat's pajamas, and I'm going, there is no way mm -hmm. on God's green earth that I can work with that person. Well, guess what? We're not going to hire him, her, it. If there is somebody that I think is the cat's pajamas and you're all going, won't fit here, won't mm -hmm. fit here, we won't hire that person. We will have discussions, and if it means going, starting over or extending the, the search, we'll do that because I'd rather get the right person. I agree. It's very expensive to have to replace people. It's very expensive and frustrating and beyond everything to, to make a mistake. And it's easy to do, we all do. But, you know, I want to maximize the potential for, ex and for success. All on the same page I like that. Yeah. It's a good policy, I think. Yeah. Um, so what else? I uh, coach the educators. And that's really like I talked about before. It's like, what's going on? What kind of support do you need? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? It's kind of, kind of like that. And then I supervise and evaluate academic staff. I don't think you know the difference between academic staff and faculty and I that's fine I'm the one who needs to know it but um, faculty members are reviewed by their peer faculty members for their educational programming so Melissa is reviewed by a couple of folks from the Department of Extension faculty and they take a critical eye looking at what her work is um, and then I do the same thing for the academic staff. We have a, a process that I follow, and that will be starting at the beginning of the year. And I will have, you know, one-on-ones with each educator and talk about how things are going and what worked and what could we do better, and we'll identify some goals. Who does Tammy's evaluations then? Oh my gosh. Yeah. We don't have an employee evaluation process in Trempolo County. <laughs> I believe we do now. I think oh, it's coming. then it will be me. Yes, it is coming. Yeah. Okay. It will be me, and and the way I do, you know, county employee evaluations, is um, I take the lead, but I share that form with all of the educators in a specific office, and ask them for their feedback, and then I sit down with the the support staff. The reason I do it that way is because. The support staff is actually supporting the educators. So they're the ones who are best capable of saying, oh, she does a great job on X, Y, Z. Boy, could, I wish she needs some training in B and C. So that's how we do it. And thank you. I'm sure Tammy is so excited. I usually, <laughs> I usually buy people a cup of coffee there, Ma Tammy, before I, I you know. Yeah, I've seen you do, go do your coffee chats with other people. I'm, I'm I can hardly wait. No, they don't. They don't seem. They don't come back weeping and wailing. So, no, nope, um, they don't. So let's talk a little bit about what you guys do. So you're going to work with me and our other educators to identify local priorities. What are you seeing out in the community that's going on? And think about it, when you're asking the educators questions or you're saying, I've seen this or I've seen that, that's part of all that information that the educators are pulling in together to think about what's happening here. Yeah, I 
like it? Um, one of the things that a board does, any board, is that concept of dreaming the future. What could be? And that's like, you know, what needs or what strengths do you see emerging? You are providing us the local view. Increasingly, we get lots of information from the state about what they're seeing as priorities, but we are getting our local view from you and from the other people we're talking to. And, you know, I really believe that there's a lot of similarity between what's happening locally and what's happening at the state level. Now, it might vary from county to county or might look a little bit different um, depending on the, the locality. Um, think about water quality. In some places, they are really concerned about the PFAS, PFAS. And it's not really a big concern here because we don't have the same kind of setting and the same kind of things happening and we're not home to 3M manufacturing. Um, but water quality is an issue and we're concerned in the with groundwater quality with the nitrate levels um, so we you know if the state's like wow water quality i want you to work on pfas we can go water quality is Im water quality is important but here it's this so we will work on it but it'll look like this at least that's what i tell so what else do you need to do? Learn what we are working on and then, you know, I need to move this thing because it's driving me nuts. Um, and as they work with your communities, that's part of the rationale for these reports. So you know what they're doing. So if somebody comes up to you, if John Lawson comes up to you right. and says, what is Adam working on? You can go, well, let me tell you Absolutely. what he's working on. Um, and then you're going to uh, share extension with your peers and citizens. Tell our story. So if you're out having a cup of coffee with a neighbor and they're going, man, you know, my son is in jail and he's got a new family and I just, you can go, oh, you need to be talking yeah, to Adam. Or, so it's that kind of thing. You're our link. Yes. So as, as a citizen, I was part of the Lions Club in Pigeon Falls, and we had the person who was running the, um, the Beds for Children program here, uh, Sleep in Heavenly Peace. And because I learned that and because I know of Extension, I knew of another group um, of churches that were kind of looking for something to do. And so otherwise, we would have had to give away all of our equipment and close up shop. But because ex I knew about Extension in their role, we were able to connect them with this other group that sent trainers to Idaho, got trained, and now we're still able to build beds for children in our communities because we were able to, uh, the citizen was able to connect them to Extension. So what group helped take, what group took over the Heavenly? Yeah. Group, yeah, so if you're not, if you're familiar or not, uh, there's a group called Jonah, Joining Our Neighbors, uh, Advancing Hope in, uh, which is a kind of a non-denominational um, group of churches in Eau Claire County. And uh, I helped create the group called Ruth, Rural Unity Through Hope here in Trempolo County of a, a number of different uh, denominations of churches. Um, and I, I, I brought that up to them and they said, hey, we'll think about it and consider it at, the, at our next meeting. They considered it and they sent people off to Idaho and trained and now there's, they're doing it. So, Cause I'm, I, whoever the group was that ran it last time when they stepped down, people were worried, hoping another group steps up and I'm glad they did. Yep. They're yep. the closed shop. I'm glad another group or whatever Yep, I was at a group build for the beds and talked to Larry and he said, who do you know? And I said, hey, I'm going to connect you with these guys. And awesome. here we are. So, and that's what you can do too. Yeah. And then, Absolutely. you know, formally because you are the extension committees, because you do have that contract, it's important to share back with big extension what you're seeing in communities because those priorities should, the state priorities should be based on what's being seen at the local level. Uh, what else do you do? You have a question I, again. I do, I always do. I, I, um, I feel like the programming is, is really great and 
like I want to learn more about it and, and try to, to promote it. But one of the things that I think I need to be able to answer for myself to be able to answer to community members is what kind of overlap or it feels a little bit like the programming may be duplicative between the schools and some of the things that we're offering here and other programming. So I'm sure there's a great answer to that, but I am wanting to know what it is so I can share it. Did you want to take that on, Adam? Because you do most of that work yeah. with. So one of the things we do, um, most of extension work actually generally isn't duplicative because we engage in a needs assessment process ahead of time. So before we do something, we reach out to all of our organizations that do something similar and say, what do you need? What's not happening right now? What do you need more support in? And then extension fills those gaps. So when we talk about like STEM education at the elementary level, it's because teachers came to us and said, we don't know anything about engineering. And I said, awesome, let me come in and I'll, and I'll work with you. Um, or it's uh, groups of, whether it's you know Gunderson and the Arcadia School District and all these others saying, we need mental health support. Um, you know We don't have anything right now. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do and, and kind of working in there. So typically with an extension, anytime you see kind of a need that's not being met, you can bring that to extension and say, hey, what are you guys doing about this? Um, and that's kind of where, where we fit in. And it's, it's more uh, supportive and collaborative. You know, when, when the Gunderson and the schools come and say, we just don't have enough mental health supports, it's not like we're going to go mm -hmm. out and be mental health care providers. We don't hire them. But what we are good at is bringing people together and bringing communication and identifying resources so they can find that. Mm -hmm. um, so it really, we really try not to be duplicative. That said, you will see us work with a lot of the agencies at the county level, at the school level, and throughout the community. Actually, one of the reports we have to regularly provide to the state is who all we are partnering with. And it's with a lot of different groups and agencies. But it's, it really is, it's more like, what's that gap? And what, what resources do we have to address the gap? So you say there is a, a needs assessment. Is that who completes the needs assessment? We, we complete the needs assessment, but who participates in that, that um, information that's collected? Um, it kind of varies by situation. So um, the, the educator does the needs assessment. It's not like every year in January we do it, but it's like as we're engaging in a new process or as we're kind of reviewing data and kind of deciding how we want to move forward kind of in the middle of a situation, we, we do kind of whether it's formal, informal, uh, different needs assessments. So with certain communities, we might do like a poll and then a conversation. Other groups, it might be kind of focus groups or community, like bringing community members to say, hey, what are you seeing? We gather some of that data and then say, okay, here, here are the gaps that we identified. Does this, you know, does this match kind of, you know, what you were saying? And if the community, whether that's um, teachers in a district or um, a, a church board or different things like that, will um, will we'll say, okay, well, here's, I'll go find what resources or programming we're able to bring in for that. Does that? Yes, thank you. And we also actually work with some of our local agencies, uh, g county agencies, as they do their own needs assessments. Like uh, we've been involved in the community health improvement plan many times. We actually led the county through its own strategic planning a number of years ago. Um, so it's sort of one of the things we do. Do any of you other educators have, oh, there's Steve, he's raised his hand. Yes, so on the, I've, I've got something, to, some input on the needs assessment and also duplicate meetings and, and that sort of thing. So a local co-op may have a crop production meeting and you know just a generic title and a week later i might have a crop production meeting but we will come at that topic from two different directions the local co-op's job is to supply inputs to farmers so theirs is more of a sales oriented meeting where i will bring in peer-reviewed replicated data and and a lot less of a sales impact there so you might look at a, at a schedule or a calendar and say well if I go to one I don't need to go to the other you know not necessarily true um, 
Also, needs analysis can look very different within the same educator's world. So these uh, cover crop test plots that are happening that we seeded in the fall started out from a series of questions across the state from farmers. So we just noticed a pattern of questions and a pattern of concerns. So we educators here in the driftless area decided to address those. So sometimes it's a formal process of I'm going to go out and I'm going to interview these key stakeholders in this topic. Otherwise, it's just somewhat almost a, a gut feeling that I've been getting, you know, these questions repeatedly in some form or another. So I'm going to address that. So, so that needs analysis can look very different. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for asking the question. A lot of people, a lot of people don't. Um, so, like I said, I do the uh, performance uh, reviews for the educators, for the county-based educators. Um, and, you know, if you ever have concerns or issues or good things to say, you know, provide that feedback to me and I'll bring it, uh, in, you know, probably incorporate it into their review. What's really important to us is supporting our local investment. You know, yeah, I put the budget together, but then I have to bring it forward to the exec finance. And, you know, we need our committee to say, yes, this is good money to spend. This is wise money to spend. And it's not very much. So um, ensure we have the resources to do our job. You know, do we have desks and computers and support staff and all those other things? And then work with me on local priorities and staffing decisions. It's not happening here now, but in another county, they have a couple of open positions and we are engaging in these sort of big discussions about how do we want this to look moving forward as we get a new person in, as we get new people in. So, and that's, that's important. We just haven't had to deal with it yet. Uh, you know, you policy and decision making as uh, described in the statute, and uh, you're providing valuable feedback to extension on, on their priorities and staffing decisions. What's happened over the years is you, there used to be an association specific to county extension committees. Then with the reorg, it changed to WEXA, and now WEXA has dissolved and you're actually a subcommittee as part of Wisconsin County's Association. So that's where you develop your voice and work with Mark O'Connell to make sure that he's sharing county feedback to, um, to the dean and to the university. So just kind of sum up, the roles and responsibilities <coughs> have evolved and changed over time. Uh, I will tell you the statute has not kept up with the changes, but nobody's, there's more important stuff right now to work on. Um, I firmly believe that we work together as partners to meet your educational needs. And I see you as the link between Big Extension, you know, UW-Madison, the full board, the entire county board, and the community. Any questions? These are my sources. Thank you. I appreciate the, over the overview. Do you feel like you have a better idea now? Definitely. Okay. I like the idea of extension helping people so much. That's it's helping the kids and helping the adults and putting God behind things. I'm going to say it out loud. It's just the way it needs to happen. So I just think all that is going to move extension even further. That's just my opinion on it. So. <sighs> Yeah. So, well, thank you. And um, as always, you know, if you don't know, if you don't have a question, get in contact about a specific program, contact the educator directly. That's, that's your best bet. If you have more general questions, it's best to contact me. Um, and I have been around a very long time, so you would be surprised at what I know. <laughs>
<laughs> Melissa's I, got her I, face on. <laughs> I would like to add something before everybody go and um, in the name of the Latino community. Um, for many years, well, I've been living here in the United States for close to 20 years. And I've been living here in this county for more than 12 years. And for how I, before I heard about extension, you know, it, for me back then, it feared me to even go and make questions. But one of the things we have to say that, um, well, but a, a little bit of my job is, you know, we, what, we have to be equally for everyone around us. So I can say that people in the community are, especially Latinx, are hearing about it and I, they started using it. And our goal is get everybody involved and participate in extension. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what's next? Is I think we're gonna move to number six, business item discussion possibility action of number A, or excuse me, letter A. Yeah. Approval. Juntos? Juntos. Who's on? Who Juntos. Juntos. Mm -hmm. Food procedure discussed last month's Juntos grant resolution. Yes. And um, what we discussed last month is, you know, let's make it easier for, for, for Adam and Mona, Monica to get to their grant money so they can do their programming. So we worked with uh, Paul, or Tammy worked with Paul and probably, um, well, she worked with them. And we have this resolution. Do you want me to read it or have you had a chance to read it? Okay. Um, so what we need is a motion to adopt the resolution and move it forward to the full board. Where has this money been before? Or is this new money? Yeah, I think this is maybe two questions. There's one where it's uh, you need to turn on your mic. Yeah, I think there's one where it's accepting the money, and then there's one where it's being able to spend money on food. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think that we're talking about the one about being able to spend money on food. Yes. From last month. Perfect. Yes. Yes. So you need a resolution. Yeah, we need a motion to adopt the resolution and move it forward. So what I think I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and read it just so it's out there. Sure. Um, whereas, uh, whereas UW Madison Division of Extension Trempeleau County applied for a grant from the Wisconsin 4-H Foundation and whereas, whereas the county was awarded this grant in the sum of 3000 and whereas this money is intended to support county educators in their work with Latinx residents involved in the Juntos program, Hutos program. Now be resolved that Trempeleau County accepts this grant award and be it further resolved that this money, 3000 be deposited in the revenue of account 101.46766 and the expense account 101.55624.348, non-elapsing account, and allowing Trempeleau County Extension um, access to these monies introduced by the education or Extension Education Committee and Communication, Andy Todd Chair, Laurie Severson, Richard Sasha, Kevin Adams, and Don Waldera. After that was read, I'll move to approve. I'll second. second. All right, so we have uh, approval, uh, move to approve from Richard Sasha, and the second by Kevin Adams. And if all, in f uh, any questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 Hearing opposed, same opposed sign. same sign. Hearing none, approved. Okay. And I will pass this official copy around uh, that you can each sign. Yes. So I think there was another one from last month where it was um, being able to spend Juntos funds on um, meals. I thought yeah, we approved that. I think, we, I think the issue was we were like, yeah, that sounds good. And then we moved on. But I, I don't think there was a first and a second and a oh. formal yes. We say we officially say that that's okay, and I think that's. No, maybe the uh, I, have, I have to say Adam is right. There, we discussed it, but there was no approval. And for us to avoid any issues in the audit procedure, we probably need a first and second to approve that we can use these funds to purchase the meals for the Hunter kids. 
All right, I'd like to see a motion. I would motion to make that, I would, uh, I would do something. I would make a motion to move forward with that as stated. I'll and second that motion. All right, we got a first and a second. Um, any questions, anything? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Pose, same sign. Haven't heard nothing, so we're going to move that forward. Okay. And I don't know if we need to have something wrote up for a signature, or we... No, no, okay. the motion, I, when, when, when we submit those, I will simply say um, <coughs> approved per uh, motion on 12-22. Okay. Perfect. That sounds awesome. All right, we're going to go to 6B, discussion about 4-H meeting rooms within the courthouse from the follow-up from last meeting. Yeah. Uh, okay, I was going to go to the exec finance, and we did bring it up there, and I found out that it's totally controlled by the sheriff's department. That's as far as I got with it. Well, um, we had lots of uh, conversations, and um, we kept asking where the policy was and uh, nobody could provide said policy so in a miracle of hunting it would have been as amazing as me finding a dodo um, I found a courthouse meeting room policy that dates back to 12 18 18 and it talks about reserving the meeting room at the clerk's office or with, yeah, with them, um, or we can get approval from the property committee. Now, this is the most recent policy that I found, written policy. I know that the safety committee was considering other things, but I found no information stating what the policy was. So as far as I know, this is the policy. And because of security issues, this is all changed totally, right? And if that is the case, they need to share the new policy. Because how can we follow a policy if we don't know the policy exists or what is required of the policy? In my opinion, I know they might have a policy, but as my, I think this policy is to stand right now until we hear otherwise, in my opinion. I, I, and we have asked um, for the policy, and what we get is not support. <laughs> I don't know if it can stand as written. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, um, but sometimes the way things are written even when they when they haven't been updated um, don't you know if this is dated several years ago it may not take into consideration the new screening processes and other things that uh, come into play with the security of the building so I say cautiously that there may be pieces of this that yes of course we should be able to use the meeting rooms I don't think that that's the question here but uh, mm, I was under the impression when we talked about this or when I heard others talking about this that there is another policy somewhere. I understand that you don't have access to it, which is a clear problem. Yeah. It, it's, a it's a very clear problem, and we have asked repeat because we want to follow the policy. We want to follow the current policy, and Don, I know that there's been changes because I watched, watched the, the security committee wrestle with so many things. Mm -hmm. And, and it's it just where do you look for policies concerning anything in the courthouse there what well, we look in the Trumpelo County um, website page because there actually is a policy and procedures there's a handbook and uh, uh, that's where I found this somehow amazingly so, I mean, it, it, it could be there, it should be there. So I'm looking at um, the Trumple County Hub. Is that where you would? That's where you would think. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing a multitude of policies, although 
kind of scattered in here right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there is no like policy manual that describes overarching policies of the govern of the government building. Well, not not set out in a way that's easy to find. And then within your own department, I presume there are policies. We, our policies are e we either follow the university policies sure, or we follow the county policies. Okay, that makes some sense to me. Okay. So how would we, what do we need to do as a committee here to go back to what I think is probably the law enforcement committee to have them put, um, put, uh, update, it, uh, update their policy or expectations in a document that's shared with the government. That we're following it. it's, it's basically their cat, so they should update it, in my opinion. Well, that's, that is indeed the case. Um, <laughs> this actually kind of goes back to the conversation you had Monday night. In a system where you have a county administrator or a county executive, no, 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 no. <laughs> the, ad, that person would be responsible essentially for organizing all that information, working with the court counsel to make sure it was up to date and relevant. The administrative coordinator in and of itself would not be responsible for that. The only time that happens is when a county takes the step to adopt what's called administrative coordinator strong form where they actually craft a unique position description that lists out a set of responsibilities it is not inherent in the administrative coordinator position people get confused about that a lot and uh -huh. since i've spent the last 10 or 15 years teaching this board over and over <laughs> and over about it um, I, my, my secretary the other day was like, did you kill a cat? It's like, no, no, I just <laughs> smacked the desk. Because um, I know at the full board, th some of them are confused about the difference. And you can hammer it all day and no offense against some of them. I don't think they'll ever get it or they're, they're stuck in their ways. Yeah. Um, so there, there, are, there, are, there are differences. Um, at this point in time, I would go back to the law enforcement committee and maybe it's who's the chair of that De doc that's um that is um oh my god i got it here <laughs> trainer ah that is trainer it would be probably enough for doc to go to to dan and say you know this is our understanding uh if it is indeed the case that it's now ruled by law enforcement, perhaps, or the sheriff, you know, we need a policy. Right. Um, and it would probably, yeah. I mean, I don't know that you need to make a formal committee request, but because it's not just us. Um, and we really, we really want to know what the rules are so that we can follow them. And, and, you know, for us, it's like we, do the public a lot you know we meet with the public a lot and if it's during the day it's no big deal we know we can come in we know the rules are easy um, where it's challenging is after hours mm -hmm. and you know if we know what the you know how to make it happen it just would be easier and I I know we have 4-H clubs who you know should be eligible to use it or we're working with community organizations I mean there aren't tons and tons of meeting spaces that meet the requirements and the requirements are well they need to be accessible well, someone at nighttime, I know in the past they've done it this way um, with committees that do me here after hours or whatever or if it's a citizen committee, usually at least one of those committee members is a county employee and or board member, so they have access. But even at that, this, the sheriff might have a question even though they have access. They have to have rules of how they let them in and the yeah. whole. So, you know, Doc, if you're comfortable or, I yeah. mean, I know Dan well enough, but it's more appropriate right. for it to come from well, you. No we can address that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and well, you know, they're, they're peers. Um, I don't know, Andrea, are there other questions about this that you wanted us to consider and think about? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I do have a note upstairs actually from one of our clubs that meets in Trampolo County who used to use the committee room. And she actually said that she actually had to have a meeting in Quick Trip <laughs> because there is no public meeting spaces that are truly available after hours. And I can strongly attest that because I use them frequently. If I ever run for public office, it will be on the stance that we need more after hour meeting rooms, <laughs> which is an interesting stance, but that is going to be my, my passion. But thank you, Doc. I did watch the exec finance committee and I really appreciated it when you brought it up. Um, but like the hard part is, I mean, I have a badge. I'm able to get in after hours. It's just the, the fact of dispatch being safe because that was previously why we weren't able to use the front door is because that has the access to the dispatch's hallway. And um, I, I, just as long as there's something that'll be considered in the future um, with the new building and how that can be, not, I'm not saying worked around because I understand expensive equipment that is really irreplaceable because we don't like spending extra money on things we already have, but then also safety. Um, plus for the most part when I'm having a meeting my volunteers are background checked like I I'm not working with just anyone for the most part if it's my core group of volunteers I'm responsible for them but also I work with them frequently enough I trust them I understand them I'm not just letting anybody in the courthouse so it's I'm I, I do appreciate that because I know I've gotten concerns about from the sheriff's department or a certain command staff about after hours they're worried about their safety which i think is a legit concern i think that's part of the reason why they might have had some well that's, yeah. that's the gray area because it's yeah. you got a lot of different departments that are coming in you know you feel good we about do. you but how does anybody you know nobody, nobody knows yeah. and it's the and I, i'm on the sheriff committee and and they talk a lot about the overtime so they got to figure something out because there's a lot of overtime that's being spent on the guards after hours so there's some things they do got to work out but we got to get it worked out so yeah. i don't see why we can't move forward on it i really yeah. don't and, <laughs> so. and the main reason because i'm the one who asked to have this put on the agenda it's yeah. mainly just awareness because i mean last year around this time i was still kind of able to and i'd talked to like jeremy i'd talked to the sheriff's department i'd gotten permission from dispatch but then suddenly i wasn't able to and so that has i mean i've spent a year trying to find meeting spaces after hours which is very tricky i would i would challenge anybody <laughs> to try and do that and then meet ada compliance um so it's it's mainly just an awareness piece if nothing comes of it that's okay because then i at least know where i can start but i would love to be able to use the county facility yeah, <laughs> after hours because i work be, here yeah, and i'm i'm here all the way. time <laughs> some certain people may not exactly just to be honest may not exactly like that but unfortunately there may be certain people that are going to go no 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 for safety reasons and all, especially at the new courthouse and, just making you aware that's a possibility. No, and I said that. I, yeah. I, I, I accept that that might be the, the <laughs> fact, and I'm, I'm just trying to at least give myself, I'm, I'm looking at all the possibilities. Yep. I'm currently on plan D right <laughs> now. I've exhausted A, B, and C, so. Well, I think we'll just look at it positively and try to get moved forward and get it done. Yep. That's how we'll I look at it. So. We'll talk, yeah. Our next committee meeting is next month, so we'll Kay. address it there. I appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Um, Love to do it. I think. Any other questions, you guys? Concerns? Anything? Then I think we should set the next meeting date. Are we going to do every other month and go to February? Is that, that the plan? That was the intent. How are you feeling, people? Did I understand that there were going to be um, like new 2023? 20, plans that were going to be presented in the, at the January meeting though that would encourage us to keep the January and then go every other from that or am I confusing it with a different committee <laughs> it's possible <laughs> uh, uh, well it's your committee and you can do what you but want there isn't a plan like there is no 2023 like overviews no, or anything I'm that we need to do I think I probably am yeah, yeah I think we're yeah think yeah it doesn't matter to me then February is it's fine okay let me get to my calendar. Okay. Beep, 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 beep. 
You know, what do we normally do now that this has been thrown off a little bit? Uh, we would normally do it uh, the day after county board, right? Usually it was a Tuesday. Well, if we go out to the little website, it tells us when we're supposed to meet, doesn't it? Mm, it the, might. The full, it should. The it should. Board meeting by mm. I believe uh, you would be scheduled to meet on the 20th, third Monday. And that would make the 21st the... But, you know... It, 21st of February, you're saying? I'm thinking. Mm, I'm almost there. Mm -hmm. Seems like it's been the third Tuesday. Yeah. I think. I think. Yeah. I think you're right. Yep. And meets the fourth Monday of every month. What does us? Mm -hmm. Oh, we can change it. To what we <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> We should update this website, though, because yeah. the public deserves to know yeah. when we're meeting, too. The big thing uh, Chair um, Todd has brought up and others have your, the website, Trump Low County website's kind of out to date. They need to clean yeah, that up or, and update things, too. So, so even months, uh, day yeah. after County Board, board. 9 a.m.? That all work good, you guys? Eight would honestly be better for me if that happens to work for everyone else, but <laughs> or eight thirty even. Eight thirty, I can do. <laughs> but it's you know, does that work for other folks? Right. You tell me. I can make nine. Eight thirty is fine with me. Eight thirty is fine with me. Okay. Right, let's do it. Eight thirty. What date would we decide? Can you repeat that again? It would be Tuesday the twenty-first. That's perfect. We don't have lessons that day so far. Yeah, February. February 2023. Yep. Yeah. I've got I've got Tuesday as being the 21st. Me too. The other thing that needs to happen um, when the calendar came out for the committees, all of the board meetings, the this meeting was not accurate on that no, calendar, and I had myself all very confused and changed my work schedule around multiple times right. because of it. So. Um, um, I'll tell you that that calendar, it comes from the clerk's office. Yeah, so who needs to tell oh, the clerk when we're That would meeting? be me, but I had scheduled our meeting for, um, we, we usually are every third Tuesday of the odd months is what we did. So I do it for a year. And then so I, this one was an extra one I had scheduled. I don't know how it got messed up. We caught it. We she should have retracted it right away, but evidently they did it, mailed it out, and then there was a retraction. So okay, yeah, no um, criticism on my part. I just want to be sure that we're communicating yeah. with whoever yeah, needs to be communicated. And we'll we'll make sure that Tammy goes in and changes it so it's the even months, third third okay, Tuesday okay. even months at Perfect. eight thirty. That's awesome. Third Tuesday even months. Okay. Okay. It happens. All um, right. And. What else is there? I can't think of anything. Are there any special uh, agenda items you'd like included um, in our February meeting? I am looking at Kevin. It's like he got the message. Well, can we talk a little bit more about the website? Is that where does that fall? Is that under communications and yeah, it is. Um, um, or that's mostly under IT. Um, they. The IT and, and uh, the clerk's office pretty much control the website. Is that the right place for it? Are we talking, um, we could even be talking um, a pay, I know not necessarily a website page, but a, I guess you'd say a Facebook page or a, something for Trumpelow County, not for the media part of it. Um, we're starting to get into uh, places that aren't on our agenda to discuss right. it. Yep. I we would say it that yeah. if you wish to have a more in-depth discussion as a committee, we can certainly put it on our uh, February agenda. Yep, I think that'd be great. Let's do that. I think that's a good idea as well. Yep. Mm-hmm. And perhaps um, 
since we know IT is in charge, maybe Tim could come and join us. All right, if anybody don't have anything else, then we're going to adjourn this meeting 1022 at 1044 a.m. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.